Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Our topic in this video lecture is the later Middle Ages. And we're going to start out by talking about some trends in terms of religion, spiritual life, first in female spirituality. How did women's sense of God within the Christian religion develop uh, during uh, the later part of the Middle Ages? Well, there were many uh, important uh, religious figures who were women during this time, even though, as we've said before, women could not be priests, they could not be the Pope, um, but they could play an important role uh, within the church. One of those women was a lady named Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, she was a nun who lived in the 12th century in Germany. In fact, she was an abbess, and as we've mentioned before, an abbess was a nun who was in charge of a, of a convent or a monastery of um, nuns. And Hildegard was so famous for her wisdom, uh, her intelligence, that uh, even popes and kings would uh, ask her for advice. Uh, she wrote many books on a number of different topics, not only spirituality and religion, she also wrote poetry and songs, and she wrote books of medicine and uh, scientific uh, textbooks. So this was a very accomplished um, intellectual leader uh, during, uh, during the 12th century, Hildegard of Bingen. In terms of her uh, religious views, um, Hildegard really had a strong emphasis on the suffering of Christ. And uh, she had uh, the famous vision that you see depicted on the left, where you see Christ on the cross, and out of his wounded side um, is flowing blood and water, which Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, is gathering up in a chalice. And so this, uh, which is a cup, like the cups that priests would use when celebrating the Eucharist, when um, distributing Holy Communion. Um, and so clearly this vision was meant to connect Holy Communion, the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, with the suffering of Christ. And as if to say that um, it's really through from Christ's suffering that the church um, comes. And uh, you can understand why a woman like St. Hildegard would do this, you know, um, in a sense, women have always been considered to be more empathetic, more compassionate um, than men in many cases. And so it's not surprising that a female saint, um, however smart or intellectual she was, that a female saint would also be very attuned to this idea of the suffering of Christ and its importance. Um, we now call her St. Hildegard because uh, Pope Benedict XVI recently uh, declared that she was a saint and also a doctor of the church. That means one of the greatest thinkers in the history of the Catholic Church, St. Hildegard of Bingen. Another theme uh, besides the suffering of Christ that pops up a lot in um, the writings of female uh, mystics, uh, religious figures from the Middle Ages, is the idea of Christ as their bridegroom, as their husband. And uh, one source for this, this image is in the Bible, actually the book called the Song of Songs, or in some Bibles called the Song of Solomon. Um, it's a, basically a poem about um, a woman who is longing for her, for her beloved, for her spouse. And um, it's a beautiful, very beautiful love poem. But in the Christian tradition, it's always been taken as symbolic of the soul's longing for God. Um, and so it's not surprising that these women who gave up husband and family to live a celibate life in a convent um, would, in a sense, think of themselves as being married to Christ, you know, filling that, that emotional gap in their life. So this becomes a very powerful idea, uh, Christ as the husband of these uh, nuns. Another important female religious leader of the period was uh, St. Gertrude the Great, also from Germany. Gertrude lived in the 13th century. It was Gertrude who first began talking about the sacred heart of Christ and trying to make that a focus for Christian uh, 
uh, devotion uh, to get people to pray to the Sacred Heart of Christ and also to honor images of the Sacred Heart of Christ. And um, a lot of Catholic churches today, even if you walk in, you'll see an image of Christ with his chest open and his heart exposed, usually with a crown of thorns on top of the heart. Sometimes the heart will be bleeding. But again, the idea is that um, great love of Christ for all um, humanity as expressed in his suffering on the cross. And this was in a way a new theme um, in medieval religion. If you look at earlier images of Christ, they don't really emphasize the suffering as much. They, they depict him as a very, the powerful ruler of the universe, very strong, very masculine. Um, but um, with this new emphasis on Christ's suffering, um, you get, uh, in a sense, a more vulnerable Christ, someone that people can connect to, um, no matter how poor or lowly um, they are. And, and this new emphasis on Christ's suffering really comes from the work of these women um, religious leaders from the Middle Ages. Well, what about the men? Um, well, I think we get a typical example of male spirituality from the Middle Ages when we look at uh, an order of um, monks known as the Cistercians, um, who were founded in 1098 when uh, some monks from a Benedictine monastery decided that their, um, their abbey, their monastery was too lenient, it was too lax, that uh, they were not really able to lead a true Christian life in their Benedictine monastery. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so they decided to leave their monastery and start a new one called the Abbey of uh, Citeaux in France, and uh, hence from that, that place, Citeaux in France, we get this name, the Cistercians. Um, the Cistercians were determined to lead a very rigorous, very difficult life of penance, that is, making themselves suffer along with Christ. Um, so, for example, the Cistercians only ate meat twice a year on Christmas and Easter. And they lived a very poor life, uh, a very simple and humble life, uh, mostly consisting of prayer. Um, and they were supposed to remain in silence, complete silence at nearly all times. There was only, only once a week where they actually allowed to talk to each other. Or I say were, but actually are, because there are still um, Cistercian monasteries in the world today. In fact, there's one in Georgia. The Monastery of the Holy Spirit in um, Conyers, Georgia comes from this Cistercian um, tradition. So in a way this is a very masculine type of spirituality. They saw themselves as in a way soldiers for Christ, they're living this very rigorous difficult life um, for the sake of God. The most famous of all Cistercians was um, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, also a doctor of the church um, uh, wrote many important texts on the spiritual life and um, thanks to St. Bernard uh, partly and to the uh, attractiveness of this lifestyle for many medieval men um, the movement, the Cistercian movement spread dramatically so that by the year 1200 barely more than 100 years after the order was founded there were already 500 Cistercian monasteries um, in, in, in Europe so very, very popular among a certain kind of man who wanted to give up everything for um, God. Now, um, if it was understandable that women, nuns, would imagine uh, themselves in a relationship with Christ as their bridegroom, um, you might be able also to imagine who these monks, these male monks, took in a way as a, a focus for their spirituality namely um, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. And many of these monks saw themselves as being in a kind of mystical marriage with Mary, um, who always uh, was taken to symbolize the Catholic Church as a whole. So as if these monks were married to the Church and married to Mary, the mother of Jesus, in a sense. And so uh, Mary becomes an even more important figure uh, in the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages, thanks to um, this kind of monastic spirituality. You see many, many images in um, churches and cathedrals of Europe 
uh, of like the one on the left there, Madonna and child images we call them, with um, Jesus portrayed as an infant sitting on uh, his mother's lap. And, and, and these are very joyful, happy images, as, as you can see. Again, very different from the earlier kind of portrayal of Jesus, like what you see in the bottom right-hand corner of a sort of majestic and kind of stern, tough-looking Christ. Um, so medieval people really liked praying to the infant Jesus. In a way, that image of Jesus on the left doesn't look quite as powerful as that very strong Christ at the bottom. But he does look more approachable, doesn't he? <laughs> and so a lot of medieval Christians preferred to pray to Jesus um, as an infant and, and also to pray to Jesus through um, his mother, Mary. All right. Well, uh, we've been talking a lot about love today and images of love. And now we come to one of the most famous of all medieval love stories, the tragic story of Heloise and Abelard. Uh, who were they? Well, Peter Abelard was a professor at the University of Paris, the, the greatest university of the Middle Ages in Europe. Um, he was a, a famous philosopher already uh, before he ever met Heloise. He was very known for having, uh, very well known for having written the book Sick at Non, uh, which means in English, yes and no. Um, this was a book that placed uh, different texts from uh, earlier writings from the church side by side, texts that disagreed with each other, and it challenged the reader to decide uh, how to reconcile those texts, um, how to reconcile the disagreements between the different opinions from earlier Christian thinkers. So this text was widely used in universities in the Middle Ages. But Peter Abelard's downfall began in the year, or approximately the year uh, 1115, when um, a young teenage girl named Heloise came to live uh, in Paris with her uncle, who was a priest named Fulbert. Now, Fulbert had heard that Heloise was, uh, had a brilliant mind, that she was really a genius and um, had tremendous potential to be uh, one of the great minds of um, the Christian world. And so Fulbert brought her to Paris so that uh, she could get a good education. And he was determined to give her the best education possible. And so he hired none other than Abelard to uh, teach Heloise and invited Abelard to come live in his house. Big mistake, <laughs> because pretty soon nature took its course. Um, Abelard uh, fell in love with Heloise. Heloise fell in love with Abelard. Um, and uh, she uh, got pregnant uh, and later bore Abelard's uh, son, whose name, by the way, was Astrolabe, I, I <laughs> which was a, a kind of instrument used um, uh, by navigators at, at sea to determine where they were on the Earth's surface. So I'm not sure w where they came up with that name. But in any case, um, they were married secretly, but Fulbert, of course, was furious with Abelard, who he saw as having betrayed his trust uh, by seducing his niece Heloise, and he vowed revenge. And so one night, um, a gang of thugs hired by Fulbert burst into Abelard's bedroom, held him down, and castrated him. Uh, that is, removed his uh, testicles. And um, Abelard, poor Abelard wrote a book about this called The Story of My Misfortunes, which became uh, really uh, famous um, throughout Europe. Um, and uh, he then uh, became a monk, joined a monastery. Heloise, too, uh, was sent to live as a nun uh, in a convent, and later she became an abbess. Um, but uh, even later in life, years later, uh, when you would think this whole thing would have blown over and she would have forgotten Abelard, uh, Heloise wrote a series of letters to Abelard in which she said that she would do it all again, and, and even then, if, if she could, she would, she would rather be with Abelard. She still loved him um, passionately, <laughs> if it were only possible to be with him. Um, and so this became 
uh, kind of a legendary love story from the Middle Ages, and those troubadours, those wandering musicians, composed many, many songs and poems about the doomed love of Heloise um, and uh, Abelard. All right, well, we talked about uh, the Capetian dynasty, um, which ruled over France. And we said earlier that at the beginning of the Competian dynasty, these kings were quite um, weak and that the great lords of France often had more power even than their kings. But that began to change in the 13th century with um, a couple of rulers, Kings Philip Augustus and King Louis VIII, uh, who were determined to build up the power of the Capetian dynasty to build up the power of the royal house of France. Um, and their strategy for doing that was very clever. Uh, Philip Augustus decided to ask the Pope to launch a crusade, not against Muslims this time, but against a group of heretics who lived in southern France who were known as the Albigensians or the Cathars. Um, and of course, you remember a heretic is uh, someone who disagrees with uh, the opinion, the religious beliefs of a certain church. And the Cathars, the Albigensians, certainly did agree strongly with um, the teachings of the Catholic Church. They were very much like the Manichaeans, remember them? The ones who believed that there was a good God and an evil God, and that this world was completely evil because it had been made by the evil God. Um, the Albigensians saw this world as corrupt and evil, and so the priests of the Albigensians, the ones who were really trying to live a perfect life according to their beliefs, gave up sex, um, they ate very little, they, they never ate meat, um, and their goal was to, in a way, transcend this world and lead a completely uh, spiritual life. Um, in a sense, they were, <laughs> they were basically um, vegans uh, <laughs> who uh, did, not, uh, did not embrace this world in any way. And, and that was actually very different from uh, the Catholic viewpoint, um, even though the Catholic Church also asked people to restrict sexuality to marriage and asked people not to eat certain foods at certain times of the year. Uh, nevertheless, the Catholic Church always taught that um, this world was basically good because it had been made by God, and um, the things of this world were not evil in themselves, as long as they were used for good purposes, like married love, uh, family life, and so forth. Um, and so, um, the unusual beliefs of the Albigensians gave King Philip Augustus an excuse to launch this Albigensian crusade against them, um, and then later King Louis VIII uh, continue it, and it was very successful. They basically rounded up all of these Cathar heretics, um, kicked them out of France, many of them ended up in Spain. Um, but the secret agenda behind the Albigensian Crusade um, was so that these kings of France could establish effective control over the southern part of France and over the lords. Um, in that um, region. And so thanks to this crusade, they were able to really extend and widen their power over a much larger area of France. They also used other means to expand their power. They would marry off their sisters or daughters to great lords to get them on the side of the kings by making them part of the royal family. They also used feudal law, that is, they got lords to swear allegiance to them as vassals, um, and so forth. Um, and so by all these methods, um, these later Capetians were able to really build up the power of the king in France and the power of the central government in France so that France became a much stronger, more unified, uh, centralized nation. But the greatest of all the Capetian kings, um, King Louis IX, we also call Saint Louis, uh, the ninth. In fact, the city of St. Louis, Missouri is named after this um, king uh, who ruled from 1226 to 1270 AD. Um, Louis is considered a saint uh, because he really did lead uh, a very holy life. He was a very humble man. Even though he was a king, 
Um, he had special shoes made with no soles, so that it looked like he was wearing shoes, but really he was walking around barefoot, um, and in a sense doing penance that way. And also Louis uh, would frequently invite very poor people, beggars, homeless people, to eat at his royal table in the palace, and he would uh, walk around and feed them, uh, serve them with his own um, with his own hands, and so um, Louis the Ninth really wanted to be a great Christian king, um, and he was famous for his wisdom, for his um, justice, uh, for his commitment to serving the poor, um, especially. Um, Louis was also very interested in relics, those holy objects uh, which medieval people loved um, so much. And um, at one point he got hold of one of the greatest relics of all, what was believed to be the crown of thorns, which Jesus had worn uh, during his suffering uh, on the cross. And so Louis decided to build um, an incredibly beautiful church to house the crown of thorns, which is now is called the Saint Chapelle. Uh, it's in Paris, and if you ever get a chance to go to Paris, don't miss the Saint Chapelle. You can see from these pictures that it's almost entirely made of stained glass. The walls are almost entirely made of glass, and it's just spectacularly beautiful. One of them, it's probably the most beautiful building I've ever seen, uh, the Saint Chapelle uh, in Paris, built by King Louis the Ninth. Um, Louis was also really excited about the prospect of going on um, crusade, and in fact, he went twice. Um, but his crusading experiences were not uh, very successful, unfortunately. The first time he went on crusade to Egypt um, in 1248, and while he was in Egypt, he was captured by the Muslims and he was held as a hostage, so uh, his people had to fork over a king's ransom, an immense amount of money, um, to get Louis out of jail. Um, the second time was in 1270, and actually it, this was also a crusade in Egypt against the Muslims. This time Louis got very sick while on crusade and actually died um, there uh, in Egypt. But in spite of these setbacks, uh, Louis IX is remembered as one of the greatest of all uh, the French kings. But um, in the year 1328, um, the throne of France was vacant. The king, who, uh, a king who had died in that year, did not have any male um, heirs. And so there were rival claimants to the throne of France. Um, one of them was King Edward III of England, whose mother had been a princess from France, and so he had a pretty good claim to the French throne um, through um, his mother. However, his rival was a man named Philip, who was kind of a cousin of the French royal family. And Philip argued that in France, um, the French throne could not be inherited through the female line, according to an ancient Frankish law called the Salic Law. Um, nobody could inherit the throne of France through a woman. It had to be completely through the male line. And so he claimed to be... Uh, the nearest male uh, relative uh, to um, the de deceased king. And so he also claimed the throne of France. And this is what triggered the war known as the Hundred Years' War between the king of, kings of England and uh, the rivals from France who claimed to be um, the kings of France. And you see there uh, on the screen that the Hundred Years' War actually lasted for 116 years from the year 1337 um, to the year 1453. But based on what we've already learned about medieval warfare, you know that uh, in, a, in, a, in a war during the Middle Ages, fighting was not going on all the time. The campaigns uh, were very limited in time. And so basically, uh, fighting was intermittent, kind of off and on for those... 116 years. Um, of course, most of the fighting was done by um, armored knights on horseback. Um, and I'll just mention this word chivalry. It's related to the word cavalry, um, which means fighting on, on horseback. Um, chivalry is a related term that brings in the whole concept of knightly behavior, how knights were supposed to treat women, especially uh, with a kind of special courtesy.
Um, but the English had a special secret weapon. They were very, very skilled at archery, that is, using bows and arrows, and they were especially good at using the long bow, which was a long bow that was held um, vertically, as opposed to a crossbow, which was smaller and was held uh, horizontally. The English uh, archers were fantastically skilled at using the long bow, and they proved this on a couple of occasions, especially during the Hundred Years' War first, in the year 1346 at the Battle of Crecy, when um, the English longbowmen really um, pounded the French cavalry and the French crossbowmen. Um, and what, what the English longbowmen were very good at was aiming at the parts of a knight's armor which were the least protected, which were the neck and the armpits. Um, and they were also very good at, at, at attacking the horses uh, who also wore armor, by the way, but it, it was it was not the solid armor, obviously. It was what was called chain mail, uh, kind of linked loops of armor. Um, but in any case, the English longbowmen knew where to aim to hit the chinks in the armor, uh, and so they were very good at defeating um, the French knights in that way. Um, later, in the year 1415, under King um, Henry V of England, the English archers once again run a, won a smashing victory over the French cavalry, the French knights, at the Battle of Agincourt. And this is kind of the climax of Shakespeare's great play, um, Henry V, um, the Battle of Agincourt. And so early in the Hundred of Years' War, um, things seem to be going all England's way, um, thanks to um, the English longbowmen. But the Hundred Years' War had to be interrupted for about a year in 1348 because of the arrival of a new disease in Europe known as the bubonic plague. Um, and by the way, this disease is still around. <laughs> Every year, a few people, even in the United States, get the bubonic plague. Um, fortunately, though, now it can be treated with uh, antibiotic antibiotics and cured quite easily. But in the Middle Ages, no one knew what caused it, and of course, no one knew how to cure it. Um, what did cause it, uh, the bubonic plague, to spread throughout Europe, uh, had to do with trade, increased trade with the Middle East um, and the Muslim world. Um, now, you might think that with the Crusades there would be more hostility than ever between Europe and the Muslim world, and in a sense there was, but there was also more contact because you have the Crusader states now in the Holy Land and they are in contact with Muslims regularly, and, and, and actually in a way the Crusades opened up um, channels for communication and for trade with um, the Muslims and through the Muslim world for trading with the Far East. But in 1348 um, a ship which docked, uh, I'll show you on the map here in just a second, we'll come back to this slide, but a ship that uh, docked in the south of France at Marseille um, unloaded uh, cargo from the Middle East, and on that ship were some rats, and uh, on the rats were fleas. And the rats also exited the ship when it was unloaded. The fleas went with the rats, and then the fleas jumped off the rats and on to people. And this is how the, um, the bubonic plague is spread, because the fleas were uh, in turn infected with the um, uh, the bacteria that causes the plague. And so uh, it started in Marseille, and as you can see here on this map, it, by June 1348 it had spread into France and around all of Italy. Um, by December 1348 it was in England, and it continued to spread until by 1350 the plague had all reached all the way up to um, uh, Scandinavia. Actually, I say the plague, but there were three kinds of plague that were involved here. The bubonic plague was the most widespread sort. Um, it attacks the lymph nodes, the lymph system of the body, and it's called the bubonic plague because it causes the sufferer to have buboes, which are large purple uh, pustules, okay, 
uh, kind of like gigantic blue-black uh, pimples that appear all over the body and um, uh, spread. Uh, the pneumonic plague is transmitted by um, coughing, so in a way it's actually even easier to transmit than the bubonic plague because you don't even need um, a flea <laughs> or a rat to do that. It can be transmitted from person to person. Finally, the septicemic plague um, attacked uh, the bloodstream. But um, the result of all three varieties of plague um, was absolutely, absolutely catastrophic um, for Europe. Because when the plague hit a community, you know, people literally could get the plague and start showing symptoms in the morning and be dead um, by evening. And uh, sometimes entire communities were completely uh, wiped out. And it's estimated that somewhere between one-third to one-half of the population, the entire population of Europe, was killed in this outbreak of plague. Now, if you just stop to think about that for a minute, how <sighs> astonishing that would be, how life would change if, if one-third to one-half of your friends, family, relations, law enforcement officials, religious leaders, everyone you knew uh, were wiped out uh, all of a sudden. It absolutely overwhelmed um, society. It overwhelmed systems. There weren't even enough people sometimes to bury the bodies uh, who were healthy enough to actually bury the bodies, so that caused further outbreaks of disease and suffering. Um, so this was really uh, an earth-shattering, mind-blowing event in the history of uh, Europe, uh, what was called the Black Death. The Black Death. Now, in response to this um, disaster, there were basically two reactions that were widespread. Um, one was represented by groups of people known as flagellants, who decided that the plague resulted from God being angry with the people of Europe. And so they decided to appease God's anger, they would punish themselves. And so they would go around Europe flagellating themselves, that is, beating themselves with whips in a very extreme type of penance or penitence, punishing their bodies, um, as if to say, God, look, you don't need to punish us anymore. We're punishing ourselves. Um, so that was one response. Now, of course, I mean, you have to understand that, that these people did not know about bacteria. They didn't even have microscopes yet. They had no idea what caused this disease. And so um, it was, in a way, natural for them, based on their belief system, to, to link it to religion and to try to come up with a religious solution to what they saw as a religious problem, God being angry with the people. But the other common reaction it was really went to the other extreme. Uh, what we call hedonism. In other words, there were quite a few people in Europe who decided, hey, you know, uh, God is mad at us. We're all going to die. Woohoo, let's party. <laughs> you know, let's just enjoy ourselves in the little bit of time um, we have uh, remaining. So uh, another common reaction was for people to simply indulge in sensual pleasures for what little of life that they thought um, was remaining to them. Very contradictory responses. But um, whatever the response, um, the result was catastrophic in the short term. But in the long term, you know, no matter how terrible a, a disaster is, there's always someone who benefits um, from it um, in uh, the long term. And in this case, um, who benefited were poor workers, including the serfs in Europe, because uh, according to the law of supply and demand, obviously with the Black Death, the number of workers available went down dramatically. And that meant that those workers who survived were able to charge more for uh, their labor, because labor suddenly was scarce. Um, so people who needed laborers would have to pay them higher wages. And so the bargaining power of poor people and workers increased quite a bit after the Black Death. Um, the position of serfs also improved as well in general because a lot of manors 
you know, with the population loss of the, the, the plague caused, were not able to continue operating. And sometimes lords would just say to their serfs, look, uh, we have to shut down the farm, we just can't go on, um, you're free, you, you're free to leave. Um, and so the serfs would be set free from their condition of, of servitude. And many of those ex-serfs um, wound up in uh, towns and cities in Europe. There was a legal principle in medieval Europe um, that if you could stay in a town for one year plus one day, you would be free, even if you were a serf. It was the town air makes you free principle. And so a lot of serfs went to towns and um, obtained their freedom that way. And so they were able to get uh, better jobs to move up in the world, sometimes to join the middle class later in, in history, you could say. Um, and so um, they actually helped to rebuild trade and commerce in Europe, um, even in the aftermath of the Black Death. However, there were some landowners that were determined to keep their manors running, no matter how few workers they had. Um, and so whatever serfs were left, instead of setting them free, they would just force them to work uh, hard, as hard as they could to try to keep the manor running. But um, the serfs even were aware by this time that they were in a better position to get um, their desires met. And so uh, we start to see for the first time in European history revolts of poor people, peasants, serfs, um, in different countries in Europe. For example, in 1358, uh, the revolt known as the Jacquerie in France, and then later in 1381, the English Peasants' Revolt led, led by a man named Watt Tyler. Now, neither of these revolts were successful, but they were a sign that in the aftermath of the Black Death, the poor people in Europe simply were not going to accept the status quo. It was the beginning of what were called, what was what we could now call class consciousness, um, and the idea that uh, poor people have rights too, and that under certain circumstances, they too would assert um, their rights within society. All right, well, uh, back to the Hundred Years' War. We're going to finish by talking about one of the most fascinating people in that conflict, one of the most fascinating people in all of history, um, in my opinion. And we now call her St. Joan of Arc, um, but uh, in English. Her name, her French name was Jeanne. Uh, Jeanne uh, lived in the, the tiny village of Arc. She was a poor, illiterate peasant girl, could not uh, read. But when she was 16 years old, she received a series of visions. Uh, this was in 1428. Series of visions. The first one was a vision of St. Michael the Archangel, a very powerful angel in Christian belief who appeared to her and informed her that she, um, Jeanne of, of Arc, was going to be the savior of France. She should report to um, the crown prince of France, a man named Charles, and tell him that God had sent her to help him become the king of France, to defeat the English and drive them out of France so that he could become uh, the king. And later she had other visions from other saints um, that confirmed this. And so uh, Joan, being a, a simple young woman of very simple but strong faith, did exactly what uh, the visions told her to do. She reported to Charles um, and volunteered her help. And Charles <laughs> needed all the help he could get, so he said, sure, why not? And so he dressed Joan up in, in white armor and put her on a horse and began sending her into battles at the head of his army. And what do you know? The French were so inspired, the French troops were so inspired by Joan, by the fact that, or as they believed that God was intervening on their side in the war, um, that uh, they rallied and they began to defeat the British, first at the Battle of Orléans uh, on May 8, 1429, when Joan was actually wounded in the arm. But at the end of the day, the French troops had won a smashing victory. Uh, over the English, which is uh, the source of one of her other nicknames, the Maid of Orléans. Um, by July 16th, the French army, uh, under Joan's 
inspiring leadership had managed to take the city of Rem, and it was in the Cathedral of Rem that the French kings had to be crowned, and so this meant that Charles, the crown prince, was now Char crowned King Charles the Seventh of France, thanks in large part to the inspiration provided by um, Joan of Arc. However, um, Joan's luck ran out, uh, and she was captured by the English army. Now, the English were also, of course, part of the Catholic Church, and they had their own Catholic bishops and priests. And so the English Catholic leadership, the bishops of England, put Joan on trial as a heretic and a witch. Um, and uh, she was found guilty, and she was burned at the stake as a heretic in the year 1431 at the age of 19. Um, but many years later, uh, in 1920, Joan of Arc was canonized. That is, she was declared to be the sa a saint of the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, that makes her the only Catholic saint who ever was actually executed uh, for uh, being a heretic. So she's in a very unusual position. Um, also, because uh, she defied the norms of her time. As a woman, she wore men's clothing. She put on armor. Um, she did things that women uh, were not supposed to do. She did them because she believed um, God was telling her um, to do them. So um, really, really extraordinary figure in world history. And in a way, uh, Joan of Arc, you could say, saved France. So that eventually the French did win the Hundred Years' War. Uh, and the French would have their own French kings, not the English kings. <laughs>